If your team is exploring Airbyte, you're probably looking to turn your data into actionable insights without the endless engineering bottlenecks that can come from building data pipelines. After helping more than 100 organizations build their own effective and reliable data pipelines, in this video, I'm going to walk you through everything you need to know to get started with Airbyte in 2025. Do that right, and you're the hero that built the data pipeline on which the entire organization runs. I am ready with my favorite cup, so let's jump into the video. Let's start by tackling the most important decision you'll have to make when setting up Airbyte, and that is choosing the right connectors. Now, let me move over here to my Airbyte account. If you go to sources, we can see there's two tabs up here, the Airbyte connectors and the marketplace. Now, the Airbyte connectors are maintained by the Airbyte team. You see there's 58 here. So you can expect continual updates here, high level of reliability, perhaps. The marketplace connectors, on the other hand, are actually maintained by the community at large. So this is the open source nature of Airbyte. You can see there's 501 connectors, about 10 times as much as the first category. But these connectors, of course, may or may not have updates depending on how popular they are. If something were to change in the APIs, the connectors may stop working and you can fix them. Now, of course, because this is open source, you can, of course, take the files, make any changes you want yourself. And this is, I think, part of the pitch for teams who want to use Airbyte. You may start with a marketplace connector, but eventually you're going to take it and tweak it and make it your own. Now, this is, of course, a pro and a con. Depends what you're looking for. But we have to make that distinction here. And depending on what connectors you're going to use, you may use a lot of marketplace connectors. It may be just a couple of of the Airbyte connectors, and that may increase the technical workflow for your team. Now, there's also, so you can see them here, technically a third category that are called the enterprise connectors. They also fall under the Airbyte connectors as well, but these are typically enterprise databases, unless you're actually going to use any of these. I mean, Salesforce Marketing Cloud may be the most common out of all of them here. This may not be as relevant. If you look at the Airbyte connectors themselves, excluding the enterprise, you'll see pretty standard stuff. Amplitude, which we're going to use today, Google Analytics 4, there's Google Ads, uh, I'm sure Facebook Ads is here. Instagram, Klaviyo. So these are likely some of the most popular, but again, it just depends where your data is coming from. So choosing the right one and understanding the expectations of what it means to use the connector makes a huge difference to your Airbyte experience. Now, let's go through how to connect one of these connectors. Now I'm going to use Amplitude. I have an Amplitude test account I use for my website and a lot of the YouTube videos here. So we need a few things. Let me go get them. All right. So I got the API key. I got the secret key. This comes from Amplitude. Again, this varies depending on what connector you're using. Some connectors are going to use some kind of SSO authentication. For example, you use the account itself to authenticate. You need to go find an API key. But nonetheless, there's of course going to be documentation for where to get the necessary connections or the API keys in, in most cases. So I got the API key. I got the secret key. I'm actually also going to do a replication start date. I probably have maybe a year or so of data here, but I don't really want it all. Let's go March 1st. And every connector is going to have optional fields. It's going to vary depending on what the connector is. In this case, Amplitude actually has two regions where they store data, the standard one, and of course, a European one that's typically GDPR compliant. In my case, I am the standard one. And the time range 24, there's actually a specific note here about how the Amplitude API behaves. We're not going to worry too much about this. We're actually going to leave them default. So now we have our connector here. You can see here that we can fork it. So this is where we can actually take the code from the Amplitude connector. Let's see what this looks like. So we're able to play around with this a little bit more, right? Where are the endpoints, the base URLs, some of the URL paths. Here are the different streams that's actually bringing in. So of course, it's bringing the events, events list, the active users, cohorts. There's a special stream actually just for the average session length and so forth. So again, if you're a technical team that really wants this level of detail and they want to be able to control exactly what's happening and of course, make any changes outside of what might be supported, which is actually quite handy. I have sometimes worked with some tools like CDPs, customer data platforms like Segment, and they're built-in connector doesn't have what we need and we're kind of stuck. Either we build it all from scratch or we go find another solution. So it is nice to be able to say, hey, we need two more streams than what this default connector offers. Let's actually add it and fork this connector code and we'll maintain it. We'll take responsibility for that, but that will give us more flexibility. So let's come back to our process here. So let's set up the source. It's going to go through a testing period. It's going to double check that the API keys, the secret keys, everything you gave it actually works as expected. Let's give this a second, see what we get back. Great, we're back. 
check, all connection text pass, the page refreshes, and now we have our connector to Amplitude. Some of our settings are actually still here if we ever want to change anything that we set up. And now we are able to add the second half of a destination. Before we do that though, let's take a quick look at pricing so you understand how all of this actually works from a billing perspective. So Airbyte recently made some changes at the time of this recording and it might change again by the time you see this. But generally we have our two initial sort of public pricing here on the far left where we have the open source. Again, remember this is a big pitch for Airbyte. So there is the ability to run this completely open source. You self-host it, you self-maintain it. So that's one option. Then we have the cloud version, which may be very appealing for teams that want some of the open source elements, but they don't want to host it themselves. In this case, the cloud options actually works based on rows. So depending on how much data you're trying to replicate, whether from a database or in the case of Amplitude, some kind of API source, I find the rows number is a little hard to estimate beforehand. Sometimes it's actually easier just to connect to different sources, go through initial sync, and then see how many rows are actually being pulled in on a regular basis, especially because the initial sync might be quite large, but the ongoing syncs may not be as large. So you can run some numbers to kind of get a ballpark. You know, we're going to be spending 300, 800, 2000 a month. But at the end of the day, you kind of have to go through it with a least a couple of connectors to have a sense as to how many rows are actually being pulled in on a regular basis. Now, some of the new pricing that everybody introduced is actually on the higher level plans, the teams and the enterprise, and they call it capacity-based pricing. I'm not gonna get into the entire details here, but effectively, instead of paying for the number of rows, you pay for a concept of workers. These are sort of like little pieces of software that are running the data or running your data pipelines. And depending on how many workers are active, then you get a price. It typically then can work with with usage or if usage increase, maybe the number of workers increase or you downgrade. So there's a little bit more flexibility. Now, this is, of course, a higher level plan. So you have to get a quote from Airbyte. So it will vary depending on what that is. But if you're in that camp, this may be helpful as it helps you abstract a little bit from the number of rows into more the processing of those rows. So check those out. That being said, apart from that, the breakdown here tends to be pretty similar. You know, you get access to all the connectors. You can do some of those transformations. You're, of course, going to have enterprise level futures like SSO and so on that are only going to be available in higher plans, but that's what we have. So let's continue back with our integration. Choosing the right connectors is of course the difference between being able to sleep well at night, knowing that everything's gonna work reliably and having nightmares that somewhere at some point, something's going to break and any reporting or any pipelines you have built have to be fixed. Now figuring out connectors is half the battle. The second half is going to determine how quickly you can actually turn all of those data points, those rows into actionable insights. We of course have to look at destinations next. So let's look at here. So just like before, we have the same breakdown between the Airbyte destinations and the marketplace destinations. Now the Airbyte ones are pretty standard. You know, the data here is going to, most likely going to flow into some kind of data warehouse, BigQuery, Redshift, Databricks. And of course we have enterprise connectors here which actually we don't for the destinations. I see the marketplace. In the marketplace, we get a few other options here, perhaps not as well-known options. Interesting Google Sheets is here actually, which might be relevant depending on how much data you're pulling. But it's most likely that the destination that you're looking for, at least the most popular ones, are likely going to be supported by Airbyte. Now we're actually gonna use BigQuery here. I tend to do a lot of work in BigQuery, but again, the process will be the same whether you use that or Databricks or something like that. So just like before, we need some specific things from BigQuery. So I already have this. So let me go get that. Okay. So I I have my project ID, I have my data set, which is the US the default, and I have the data set ID itself. That's looking good. Then we have two options. Again, this is a big query specific, whether you do batch standard inserts or the GCS staging. I'm actually going to use the batch standard insert. This actually just uses SQL insert statements into the data warehouse. The GCS, which actually uploads files to Google Cloud, and then from Google Cloud, they get processed into BigQuery. I've actually done that with another project, especially when we have to deal with large CSVs that we want to process into BigQuery. I don't necessarily think this is, this is helpful, and I'm not actually 100% familiar on the difference here specifically in Airbyte, whether one would be better depending on data volume. If you do know that, post in the comments below. I'm actually curious. I've always sort of done the batch standard inserts as the way to go. Now here we need a JSON key, a service account. Let me go get that as well. All right, so we got our JSON key. Then we have a deletion mode. Again, I'll keep this as, as default. And then we have some other values here, which again, we're not gonna use. And just like before, we have some documentation on the right side. So let's see if this all works as possible. Okay, so everything was successful. The JSON, the different projects, IDs. So now BigQuery has 
was connected, the tests passed, the JSON, the API keys, in this case, actually the project IDs were correct. And now we have a destination available here in our screen and we're ready to create a connection where we can take our sources and our destinations and actually bring them together. Now, a few more guidelines here on destinations I wanna make a note of before we move on. Obviously the volume of data will affect where you go with a data warehouse or just a database. These days, the difference may not be as obvious. Typically a data warehouse just makes more sense. Second, using the popular options tends to make life easier overall. So these are the big queries, the Redshift, the Databricks, the Snowflake. If you go with something outside of that, it may not be the worst decision, but you have to be aware that the compatibility may not be as popular. You know, if I take BigQuery, for example, doesn't matter where I go, it's probably gonna be some kind of integration either to pull data out of BigQuery or to send data into BigQuery. Third, depending on your ecosystem of your technical system, that may define your decision. So if you're very heavy on AWS, going with Redshift makes a lot of sense. If you're very heavy in the Google Cloud world, going with BigQuery makes a lot of sense. However, if you have some kind of other system, perhaps a little bit more outdated, you know, I worked with a client recently and they were using a lot of Azure. So Azure has data warehouses, but they are not as compatible, they're not as easy to work with. So that's a little tricky. In their case, we end up going with BigQuery, even though it was outside their ecosystem. But that's not the most ideal unless you have a very outdated system that you're working with. If you're in doubt here, honestly, stick with the most popular. Again, Snowflake, BigQuery, Redshift, Databricks. Honestly, any between those four options will be fantastic and you're gonna have a lot of modern futures. Now making the right decision, even if you go outside your ecosystem, can save you a lot of headaches. Now we are ready to finalize our connection. If you want help ensuring you're collecting the right data, get in touch. I work with organizations and help them build awesome data stacks that make a lot of this work that we're doing super easy. You build the right data pipelines and you can extract the right insights. Click the link on the screen below to watch a short video on how it works with organizations. If not, let's go back to the rest of the video. If you're not done yet, before you hop off, we actually have to look at what's arguably the most important part of setting up Airbyte, which is making the connections. So we go back to our screen here. We have a source, we have a destination. Let's make a connection. So now we need to actually bring them together. So we're gonna take a connection. We get a chance to choose the source. We're gonna use Amplitude. Choose our destination, which is BigQuery. And now it's going to just look at what potential streams are available. We actually saw this a little bit when we looked at the Amplitude code. We saw there were six streams, but let's see what Amplitude actually comes back here and of course this will vary depending on how many sources you're pulling in so as expected we get five sources actually i guess technically six if you want the average session length we can see the number of fields per source now i'm not, not going to take them all because i want this to be a little faster i'm actually just going to take the events which is probably the one that has the most data in here we can see the specific fields that this is bringing in again this is amplitude specific but depending on what source you have the data will vary here we're going to click next before we do that though let's look at some options out here we're going to replicate a source where we maintain an up to date copy of your source data. That's kind of what we want. Or we can do append historical changes. And then we have a couple options here, whether we append new rows and updates only or append full snapshots. So we're actually going to replicate the source. I imagine this will affect how much data is actually moved from source to destination. So this may have pricing considerations. And again, you may just need to maybe run a couple tests, see what the data looks like over a couple weeks, and then make your choices. Sometimes, as I mentioned during the pricing stage, it can be a little hard to really estimate the exact impact on your billing until you actually see it flow through. Let's click next here. So we have a connection name. I like that. We want to schedule it. Am I just going to make it? Yeah, let's, let's just schedule it. Sure. Every 24 hours. Uh, okay, that's fine with me. We're going to sync them all to my data set in BigQuery and we'll probably give some namespace based on destination. That's okay. We can have a custom format, of course, if we really want to, but I think the defaults will be fine. I don't need any prefix. Let's look at some of the advanced settings. Always want to check those advanced settings, see what we have. Let me see, propagate changes. That looks fine. This is how it handles different stream changes. If the schema changes, uh, which is unlikely with APIs like Amplitude, they tend to be pretty stable. And if we want to backfill new or rename columns, Okay, I think we're gonna keep everything as, as the same. And now we're gonna finish and sync. Now, how long this will take, again, will vary a lot depending on your destination. But now the whole process is going, this is the initial sync. Again, sometimes the initial sync can take a few days to actually complete all together. But once this is done, then the data will be a BigQuery and then it will just simply update itself every 24 hours as we know that in the connection settings. A few more things just to look at here while, while we're together. You know, we have a bit of a timeline on the different syncs. We of course have our schema that we saw earlier. We saw mappings. 
which is not available here, but this just allows you to run some transformations on your data. And then we have transformation itself, which look, looks like this is DBT instead. Kind of curious actually, what's the difference between Mappins and transformation? Same thing. If you know the difference, actually post in the comments. It kind of seems to be doing the same thing. I always thought Mappins was transformation. So let me know in the comments if you do know that. I'd love to find out. Then we have sentence, which we saw earlier before. Okay, it is done. Some time has elapsed here as I watch this to slow. Now this is actually not that much data. So it was, it was a little quick. So we can see now that it says 60 were loaded. We have some data in our charts now. And of course, this is going to sync every 24 hours. Let's go to BigQuery and see what this looks like. So this is my BigQuery account. This is our project, if you remember, Practical Analytics. And then we have a data set that was called YT Sample Data. And now we have a new database in here, or a new data set called Events. You can also see actually there's some Airbyte internal stuff here. The Airbyte will maintain it if needed. But here's the events table that we just brought in. We just brought one stream from Amplitude. We can see some Airbyte related data. And of course, the different schema that we briefly saw when we looked over the data. And of course, if I just do a very simple query here just to get all the data here, then we get a bunch of amplitude related data ready to be queried, modeled, and of course, activated to extract insights. So in minutes, you've gone from data being stuck in some kind of source, amplitude for our example, to being stored in BigQuery and ready to be converted into actionable next steps for you. And that is really the power of Airbyte. You can see everything was pretty simple. You have all the different keys, different keys, connectors you get going a lot of stuff happens behind the scenes and if you have any errors there's of course different ways of dealing with that but just a fantastic tool for building data pipelines and doing it quickly setting up airbyte is just the first step if you're still struggling to turn all your data doesn't matter if it's from 5 10 or 15 different connectors into something useful then check out this next video it covers the seven reasons why organizations don't always get the value they want from their data most of the seven reasons are actually much easier to fix than you may think. So watch out next. My name is Ruben Ugarte, and I'll see you in the next video.